And you have on the tables this uh, image. And as you can see, uh, it's line, right? Colored lines. And most of you can see, right? If, if, if not, you can show it to your neighbor. And so the game is, what is this? Can anybody propose a proposition for what this is? You can throw any idea, it doesn't matter. An end paper from um, Tristram Shandy. Very good answer. Sort of a game spoiler there. <laughs> but it's not Tristram Shandy. Uh, indeed, uh, it is not a psychedelic painting from the 70s. It's an end paper. It's from Descartes' Meditation 1647. It's the first edition. And the reason why I'm showing this is because there's two reasons. One is that Tim Ingold is going to talk about lines. Uh, he has a book coming out in April, which I believe is called The Life of Lines, which is a theme he has been uh, working on for many years. The other reason, reason I show you this is that I also checked, and apparently the first edition of the Principia Mathematica of Newton also has uh, marbled end paper like this. And it struck me at that, uh, just starting researching on this a little bit, uh, that 80, 70 to 80% of the books of the modern, pre-modern period, of the classic period, uh, how do you call it? from the uh, uh, late 16th century to the end of the 19th century are texts that are circled by this kind of images which to, which to us uh, seem quite psychedelic but when I saw this I thought Descartes saw this what was going on in his head when he opened his own book and saw this uh, Newton's uh, imagination when uh, his attempt similar to Descartes to sort of create a new territory for sciences and reason uh, saw their text embedded by this chaotic images. So of course uh, I will not propose uh, an answer, this is just sort of to open the, the debate and I will Without further delay, give the uh, mic. Actually, I won't give him the microphone because he has one. But please uh, welcome Tim Ingold. Psychologists have a, have a very odd idea about what creativity is. They, they tend to think that it's some kind of X factor, some kind of mental spark plug that some people have and some people don't. and they, devoted a lot of attention to trying to discover this factor inside people's heads. And they say that if we didn't have this spark plug, or if some of us didn't have it, there'd be no culture, no history, no art. We'd be just like all the other animals. So their view is that somehow there's, there's something that some people, at least, carry around in their heads. And they call it this, this creativity thing. And they've been trying to figure out what it is. For example, um, one uh, philosopher, kind of psychologist, who's contributed a lot to this debate, is uh, Margaret Bowden. And she says uh, that there are two kinds of, of creative ideas, and being a psychologist and used to this kind of thing, she calls them P-creative and H-creative. And a, a, a P-creative idea is one where um, everybody else has had it before, but it's the first time you had it. So you're kind of catching up with everybody else. An H creative idea said is, is one that nobody has ever had before. Um, and, and the idea is that somehow it's these H creative events that n have never ever happened before that, that, that they um, are what give rise to, to human history. So um, P stands for psychological and H for historical. So psychological the creative ideas, they're, they're the ones that you're just catching up with everybody else. But the, the H are historical ones. Those ones um, make history. And yet the very odd thing about this 
very psychological view, is that the ideas themselves don't belong to history at all. Uh, they, they pop up in individual minds, and so far as the psychologists are concerned, minds are completely outside history. They, they're, they're things, they're inside the head, they, they depend on their own resources. So ideas pop up spontaneously from these individual minds. They only really become historical when they enter into some process of communication and um, dissemination. So if I took that view, and said, then you think, well, what on earth is history? And a lot of psychologists think that history is basically a record of innovations. So each, each of these eight historical events was something new, un, unprecedented, never happened before, a new idea. You add all these new ideas up, <coughs> and you get history. But the problem then is, well, how do you know whether an idea is historical or not? How do you know that nobody's ever had it before? So somehow or other you've got to check through. I mean, suppose I woke up this morning and had this fantastic idea. I thought, ah, nobody's had this before. Is this P historical or H historical? And then going to have to go through the entirety of the whole of human history to find out whether anybody's had it before. And if nobody's had it, most likely somebody has, but if nobody's had it, I'd say, ah, wow, well, history was actually made um, at, my, at my desk this morning. So imagine a baby. I, mean, I can't think of anything more creative than the process of bringing, conceiving and nurturing and bringing a baby into the world and then that baby growing up into a child or adult and so on. Can you think of a more creative process than that? If you were Margaret Bowden, you would have to say that, wow, you, you, so the baby suddenly appears right, in, the, in the maternity ward and everybody says, wow, this is novel. We, you know, we haven't seen anything like this before. And the, and, and the parents think, we, we must have had a, a, an H creative idea at the moment when we conceived the child. And there it is. Uh, the, the realization that when we talk about conception, actually, um, that sort of model is often often assumed that you conceive the child as this kind of idea, a glint in the eye, and then um, then there it is. But but really, I mean, obviously, the growth of the baby is surely created in the second sense. It's about the creation of personality in community, a person coming into being within a nexus of social relations. And, and then the growth of that child, let's say, that baby, you see, it grows up. And, then, and that growth <coughs> is not just in strength and stature, of course, but in the work of the imagination and the formation of ideas. Because ideas, too, have lives. I, I always think that ideas are rather like places you visit. You go to a place and you say, okay, you look around and then you go away again and then you come back to it later. That agency again. It's a matter of, of, of somehow reading back from objects to ideas that allegedly are supposed to have motivated them, and, the, and, and that is understood as a process of abduction. And that idea of abduction comes from Charles Sanders Peirce, who was famously obscure about what it meant. But it, that, that in simplest terms, it's, a, it's the same strategy that is used by a detective, in which he finds that um, it, it, you're, you, you see some clues. A blood-stained carpet, right? And and the detective's job is then to go back, read back from the blood stain on the carpet to an extraordinary event, an extraordinary event, say a murder, from which the blood stain then follows with almost uh, with, with, with complete inevitability. So you have an extraordinary event. If somebody's murdered, well, actually, um, you're likely to get blood on the carpet. So the the link. Once you once you once you made the jump back to the extraordinary event, then the link from that to the material clues is, is kind of obvious, and um, and the idea is well, perhaps we should treat works of art in the same kind of way. That the work of art is an extraordinary object. We leap back into the creative agency of the artist, and then see that the work follows with a kind of inevitability from that idea that was present in the artist's head first. So again, there's this notion of reading back from objects. Um, Two ideas. But that seems to me to be um, completely wrong, actually, because it, what, what it misses out is the form generating potential of the material itself that the artist is working with. I mean, usually the artist hasn't got, got much of an idea of what he or she is creating at the time, but there is some sort of engagement with materials over a period of time out of which things tend to get formed. So, in order to understand the work of art, we have to we have to join with the artist 
in the movement that gave rise to it. So we have to read creativity forwards rather than backwards. We have to follow the materials. In a way, it's like moving upstream so that in terms of that analogy with the detective, it's like becoming criminals ourselves. We join with the murderer and follow the action through. So, things in this view, like works of art or whatever, things perdure, they carry on through time. Um, the example that I always use is, is, is my own, because I play the cello, and like most cellists, cellists I play the suites of J.S. Bach over and over again in a hopeless and forlorn attempt to get them right, which I shall never do, because nobody has, then you can carry on trying. But the, the, the extraordinary thing is that although, of course, Bach penned these pieces a long time ago, and left a lot of latitude for the players in exactly how they're done, the music itself is never finished. It carries on through all the performances that are ever done of it. So that when you start to play, it's like jumping into the river and carrying on from there. So the, move, the music itself is always crescent, it's always undergoing creation. It's never, it wasn't as though Bach finished it then, there it is, and now all you have to do is to perform it. It's actually that in the performance, you are continually, you and everybody else who's playing it, is continually creating this music and carrying on with it. And that means then that there is absolutely no opposition between creation and imitation. That, that every time I play, of course I'm... In a sense, I'm copying, I'm playing the same piece over and over again, I'm going for the same walk over and over again, and yet every performance is an unrepeatable original event. It's very much the same in calligraphy, and, and um, calligraphists explain about this, that, that, that in calligraphy you, you, you perform a movement, and the calligraphy then is a trace of that movement, but you can never go over the same movement twice. You can't. So, Side, oh, I don't like that one, I'll go over it again. Once you've, once you've done it, you've done it. And, and, and there's no um, going back. The creativity inheres in, in the skill practice that actually brings forth the work. Um, not in some idea that is already fashioned beforehand. But then, you need, then, then, then that leads to the question, well, what is the role of the imagination in all this? What role does imagination have to play in creative practice if we reject the idea that creativity is about enacting some idea that has already been formed by the imagination? What if the imagination is not about creating advanced representations of what is to be made? And I want to, I want to argue that, that imagination is not, in any sense, a mental capacity that permits the spontaneous generation of ideas, which is what the psychologists tend to think, but rather a way of living creatively in a world that is itself undergoing continual creation. I contain this notion of correspondence, which I find rather helpful. And by correspondence, I don't mean this, I don't mean matching, like this matching that. I mean things answering to one another. And the, the model is people writing letters in the old days, as they used to. You, know, you send a letter to, to, to your friend, the friend would read it and sit down and write a letter back, and the, the letters would go on back and forth. And, and each correspondent is answering to the other. And I want to have this sense of, 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 of a creative movement as one in which um, persons, <coughs> materials, whatever, are continually, as they're moving through time, continually answering to one another in that kind of movement of, of, of correspondence. Um, moving upstream. Moving upstream from um, things already being there to that point at which things are just about to come. I mean, like when you're playing the trumpet, um, and you're, you're actually, you're, I don't play the trumpet, but I can imagine it. You're, you're bringing up this air from your lungs. You're about, you're about to blow. In a way, you're, you're right there at the very point at which that sound begins to appear. It's not already there. When you're playing, it's not there yet, really, because you're still doing all this pumping. So, so, so it's like when you're actually playing, it's like bringing yourself right up to that moment when the sound is not there yet, but it's just about to be there. And, and that, I think, is where um, imagination is... is um, 
to say that somehow imagination moves upstream from um, where things are to where things appear, or from, from talking about not what appears, but to the appearing of what appears. And in that sense, imagination leads from the front, but it doesn't yet know where it's going. I think that this word that we have in English, longing, is a beautiful word for that. Uh, the sense um, that you long for things, um, and then the longing is this lovely view of sort of length, like a going on, going on the line. You long for things, you don't know what they are, but you know you're longing for them. And, and that imagining is a kind of remembering as well. It's, it's beautiful the way that word captures the, the fact that all imagining really is remembering. And whenever we go somewhere, we find we've already been there before. And that, that, that looping around. But that's another thing. So I had this feeling that, what, that whatever we're doing, um, in any kind of skilled practice, we are both completely prepared and yet totally unprepared. What leads out and what follows behind. And the conventional cognitive science account is that, um, is that mastery leads and submission follows. The mastery is mental mastery. You have your mental plan uh, and uh, your body then acts it out. So you have some cognitive, cognitive mastery that then dictates the actions of the submissive body. So the mind does, and the body undergoes. And it's a sort of passive undergoing. That's a conventional view. I want to put that the other way around, to reverse the temporal priority of mastery and submission, and suggest that in any kind of skilled practice, whether it's going for a walk, playing a cello, whatever, Submission leads and mastery follows. And the other way around. So that out in front is an aspirant imagination that feels its way forward. Back in the rear is skilled, prehensive perception. So that means that life is held in a tension between submission and mastery, between imagination and perception, between aspiration and prehension, between exposure and attunement. And in each of those pairs, <coughs> the first leads and the second follows. But this sort of undergoing I've been talking about is not a passive undergoing. And the trouble is that we, we, we have difficulties in expressing this in English because we are used to a distinction between the active and the passive voice. In the active voice, um, I do something, that's the active voice. In the passive voice, that something has been done to me. So that, so that the active is doing, the passive is undergoing. And because of this link, this grammatical link that we have in our grammar, that wasn't there in ancient Greek and isn't there in many other languages, because of this link between undergoing and passivity, we find it very difficult to express a kind of undergoing that is active. I think it's a kind of action without agency. I don't like to know, instead of saying that whenever you've got action, it must be the effect of some agency, you say we've got action. We don't have to put an agency in front of it. Because in, in an undergoing that is active, the, um, the doer, in a sense, remains inside the process of his or her doing. That's what in grammar is known as the middle voice. And the middle voice of the verb, which... Um, was present in classical Greek uh, and is present in a number of other non-Indo-European languages but which historically disappeared from um, English and other European languages as we use today. We don't, we've lost that sense of the middle voice of action without agency, of a creative, active kind of undergoing where submission leads and mastery Follows. And I, I think I'm making a proposition to try and, try and um, bring, back, bring that back. <coughs> and and to, to act in the middle voice, I think, is exactly what it means to actively undergo. It means that perf the performance, the things you do, is 
an act, actually an act to which you submit. And then you might ask the question, well, where did it come from, this act that you did? Because you didn't decide it. Somehow it, it, it seemed to land on you. And, and I think that, that um, we have to think about actions then, not as belonging to us, as though I was, I'm, I'm the author of this action, I had the idea, then I'm going to do it. But rather actions are things that fall to us. And they fall to us because of what we owe to the world for our own existence. And then the world in the future owes its existence, at least in part, to what we've done. So action then belongs to that flow of, of, of correspondence, right? Each uh, us answering to the world, the world answering to us. And you think, well, who do these actions belong to? They don't belong to me. Well, they don't really belong, well, in a sense, they belong to history. But in a broader sense, such action belongs to life. So my conclusion is that the creativity of undergoing is the creativity of life itself. Okay. Thank you very much. That was very um, enjoyable and interesting. I was really struck particularly with um, uh, the submission leading mastery, which I was very happy to hear you um, clarify. Um, I think maybe it's something I have hoped at thinking, um, but not been able to formulate. But I, I suppose that I, I don't. I'm sorry. I don't think it's a fully formed question. But I, I suppose what I was trying to think about that when you were speaking was the impact that that then has on the reception and criticism of perhaps, as a, for an example, an individual artwork. Mm -hmm. Because if submission leads mastery, then we have no original. So we have no. We we have no recourse to. Tr there, there's no linearity yeah, in, in terms right. of the criticism of it, which I find intriguing. Yes, I haven't really thought about that one through, but it must mean that we would have to think of criticism in a, in a rather different way. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I there's a, on the top of my head something that Foucault said along these lines, that, that I can't remember the exact words, but wouldn't it be nice if we had, a, as he said, something like this, if we had a kind of criticism that wasn't always harking back to what people had done and whether it was good or bad or what was the matter with it, but instead actually um, moved along with something and opened things up um, even more, a kind of forward-looking uh, criticism that joins with things and, and moves back in, in rather, because I think probably most criticism tends to be very retrospective. This was done, this was made, now we're going to look at it and produce some kind of assessment. You're going to say, well, this is done, this is made, so now let's, uh, let's go with it and see where it takes us and see the power of the thing in that. Enjoyable and um, lots to think about there. Um, um, one of the things I was struck by though was the talk went along was a sense in which a lot of what you're talking about seems to be about uh, sort of an idea of, well, particularly your cello example at the end, of the lone yeah. uh, creative yeah. individual yeah. struggling yeah. with an instrument of some kind, trying to follow some music or trying to work with material and so on. And I, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about how, given the, the beginning you were talking about a social life, mm -hmm. how that might then expand and think about people being creative together, <laughs> working together, or doing something creative for someone else. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, and I, I, I hope that, because I, I, I keep getting told off for doing this, like concentrating on the lone, yes, the lone craftsperson or the lone musician, struggling with, with material or music or whatever it is. But, but I, I, I hope that with this notion of correspondence, which I like, sort of seems to work, a lot, um, that, that then you can uh, think of a, a whole community of people, or how many people you want, um, correspond answering to one another. And I want to, I want to, to think about what, what if we thought about social life. Never mind about the question whether that's restricted to humans or not. But what if, if we think about human social life, carrying on, and think about it rather like. Um, uh, polyphony, uh, where each line, or counterpoint, where each line is answering to each and, and every other all the time, then that would give us a better model for talking about social life than interaction. Because the trouble I have with interaction, or even intersubjectivity, is that it tends to think of the between, as well, here's this, here's that, and there's this thing going back and forth. Um, it's thinking of the participants in social life 
at points or blobs or entities. But if we think of every participant, this is where the lines come in. If we think of every participant as a line, um, a, a kind of life history that is, that is moving in time, then you can think of the way in which these lines are responding to one another in, in the course of time. So there I think we can take this as a model for talking about social life in, in the lab. Just, just because you mentioned um, uh, Bergson mm -hmm. and uh, Whitehead and basically the process philosophy which which I personally also find very inspiring and I think that according to that philosophy and to what you said today maybe the biggest mystery is not so much uh, life uh, if we agree that it is a creative flow uh, the difficult part is actually order uh, and I think that philosophy opened that question and it's still to be explored how do we create orders and um, are we editors of life which could be an interesting way of seeing it uh, are we uh, in French the, the, the word ordinator means actually computer which is another way of looking at things but maybe not so uh, positive so I'd like to know what are your intuitions on, on that I, I, agree with you, I agree with you completely about the problem Namely, that, uh, that as, as you said, that if we if we take it that we're agreed on the <coughs> basic ideas of a process philosophy, then the problem is how do we explain the persistence and continuity of form of any kind? We've got it just in the, in the organic world. You, know, you, you, you recognize all these different kinds of animals and plants, and there they are, and, and, and they seem to have a certain constancy about them, which enables us to recognize one kind of animal and another kind of. <coughs> and as you say, um, mostly for, in the natural sciences, um, the problem has been been wrongly formed. That's to say, the the default assumption has always been that things will stay the same. And the problem is why do they change? And so how do we explain evolution and the rest of it? Actually, the problem is the other way around. How to form a stick? And the way I've been thinking about it. Um, apart from a sort of heavy dose of self-organizational theory in which forms that are, that form themselves, like soap bubbles do, you know, in certain sort of circumstances. But, but beyond that, I've been thinking about it in terms of the contrary forces of, um, of tension and friction. And again, I've found that the idea of the knot is helpful. Because in a sense, a knot is something where you, you've, you've got a lot of movements and you've been, been tying these strings and then you've got something that sticks and, and it might be quite difficult to untie. So you've got, you've got a, a pretty fixed form and you think, well, how did that form come to be? And how, how is it sticking? It's sticking there because the forces that have created it have been pulling in different directions in such a way as to create a friction which actually holds the thing in place. So that I think that, that the, the way I want to think about it anyway is in terms of, 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 of how contrary forces of tension and friction work together to make things stick for a certain length of time. Um, but that's far from a solution and you're quite right to say that because mainly in the natural sciences, the default way of posing the question has been upside down, there's a huge amount of exploring to be done. I mean, they're, they're, they're in biology, people are they're just beginning to realize that if one's going to understand the forms of organisms, you've got to go into ontogenesis and not look at evolution. And, um, and of course, and, and, and so now they're all beginning to look at ontogenesis, and then they all claim that they've made these radical new discoveries when we've been telling them all and all. It's a, it's putting it onto genetic first. And you, you, you rightly mentioned biology because the last findings, uh, for example, with the total potency of the cells, tend to confirm uh, uh, process development institutions. Absolutely. The fact that the, it's life is a differentiation uh, process rather than a building mm. process. Yes. 
I, I tried to use the term as, rather than external agglutination, I, I tried to use this term interstitial differentiation. It's somehow the way in which something differentiates is that from the inside in formation. It works quite well for, for because I'm an anthropologist, and you think about kinship, and you think about what happens in the history of households when um, people marry and they have kids, and then the kids leave, and then they form other unions with other people. What happens in a household is a process of interstitial differentiation. It doesn't break up exactly, but it, it differentiates the people in it differentiate themselves out from the inside. Mm -hmm.